Hi, my name is Bob Anderson, and in this tape we're going to be talking about techniques that you can use to make your tapes look more professional and uh, have a good, polished, professional graphic look. Whether you're in a gra uh, professional graphics environment or whether you're just doing tapes you know, for yourself, these are things that you can do to make your tapes look more like what you're used to seeing on broadcast television. Before we start, let's take a quick moment and we'll talk about some of the elements of design that you see in graphics that you're used to seeing. Um, you don't want to be doing anything that's really outrageous, unless of course that's the, look, the type of look that you're, you're going for, but typically you want to be working with uh, the types of elements that you're used to seeing on television. Uh, one of the big uh, tenets for anybody working in graphics, I think, is to watch television shows that you think have a good graphic look and to steal a lot. Um, the news networks that are on now have really great, very professional graphic looks, and they tend to change from uh, month to month. Uh, that's a real good source for material. Anyway, let's talk about what you actually do when you design a graphic. One of the most important things that you do uh, in designing a look for a tape or a show is that you want to have a contiguous look for your graphics from beginning to end. Um, you don't want to be bringing in dramatically different graphics every time. Uh, there's a lot of tricks that we can use to get that sort of a look and we'll be discussing those a little bit later. Uh, another thing that you want to do is sort of logically think out the design for the graphics that you're going to be, be creating. For instance, when you first start off on your graphic, typically I'll start off with say a color spread or something like that. The color spreads have a, usually a lighter color and a darker color and those tend to indicate on your graphic that there's the sun is shining from a, a particular direction. Keeping that in mind, you always want to design your graphics so that the sun is shining from that angle. So if you're going to put shadows on, they need to be in the correct spot. If you're going to be using lightening and darkening to create bevels and whatnot, those need to correlate with that lighten and darken section of the background. So with those things in mind, let's talk about some techniques that we can use to make your graphics look great. So let's get into toaster paint and we'll start creating. Uh, simply pull down under programs and click into toaster paint. Yeah, so here we are. Now to create a color spread, very simply, I'm going to go in and set up uh, into range mode so that I'm be painting with a range of colors. And I go to transparency and warping, which is where we set up our hotspot controls. We move this little knob to indicate where we want the hotspot to be. So I'll put the hotspot in the upper left hand corner. In other words, the center color is going to be in the upper left hand corner. Now I'll go to our color menu, and in here I have two selectors, one for center color and one for edge color. Now it's set up in kind of funky colors right now, so let's pick some different ones. Usually uh, little blue spreads are pretty good uh, for broadcast work. Blue always works very well on television. So let's take this color and use this as our center color. In other words, that's going to be in the upper left-hand corner. And let's pick a purple. I'll pick one out of here. That's probably pretty good, and we'll use that for our edge color. The upper left hand corner is going to be the light blue color and the lower right hand corner is going to be the dark purple color. So I'm ready to go. I'm going to use the keyboard equivalent of W on the keyboard to assign this to the whole screen and it'll draw this out. Now, I've set this up on purpose with the lighter color in the upper left hand corner. That's sort of the graphic look that people are used to seeing. That's what you're going to see the most. This is why like in the character generator, the drop shadows are usually off to the right and down. So usually the sun comes from the upper left hand corner. So going back over here, if we look, it appears as if the lighter color is in the upper left hand corner. That's where the sun is. So now it's very important that if we draw shadows or anything else on our image, that it always correlates to this. You put the shadows in the wrong way and it looks lousy. Now a graphic element that you see all the time is the streak. Uh, basically it's just a f transparent box that falls off from being opaque to transparent. Uh, this is a very simple technique, very easy to do in toaster paint. Real quickly here, I'm going to pop into normal mode so that I'm not painting with a range any longer. And we have this great tool under options, it's called the grid. Now what the grid does, there's two buttons that control it. The set grid button turns your pointer into these weird dots. And what these dots represent is basically like graph paper on your screen. You can only draw within the dots. Let me click a dark purple for my color. This will make for a good, uh, a good box. And if I just draw here, I'll use the keyboard equivalent Shift D to go into draw mode. I'm just going to draw around on the screen. You can see that I'm only allowed to draw where those boxes were. Okay? This isn't at all the look that we're trying to achieve, but you get the idea how the grid works. Okay, I'm going to pop back over into transparency and warping and set this to be 0% transparent 
in the center and 100% on the edge. And this slider here, I'm, I'm on the horizontal transparency slider. I'll set it off to the side. Now I'll use the keyboard equivalent of Shift R for a filled rectangle and I'm ready to make a streak. Now I've got the grid set, I can only draw on those squares. As I draw this across, I only really have the option of drawing one grid square high, or two, or three, etc. But I want a one grid square tall box. And you can see it very quickly, very easily makes this transparent fall off box. It's real easy for me to guess that I need to start my next one about here. And when I click there, it'll only allow me to draw on that grid square. So once again, you can see how using the grid allows you to very quickly, very easily make a set of sort of standardized el graphic elements all the way across your screen. I'll hit the escape key on the keyboard to get rid of the menu so we can see how far down we want to go. And this is probably about good enough for right now. Okay, I'll hit F10 on the keyboard to render that up to my program out so I can get a good view of what that looks like. That's probably pretty good. Now one thing that should be pointed out is that when you're working on the Toaster 4000 in Toaster Paint, you're looking at a 256,000 color display. So although this looks really good, when you look at your TV, it looks about the same. It's not going to be exactly the same. In fact, looking at the computer screen right now, I can see some banding in the uh, background. So it's always a good idea to hit the F10 key you know, pretty often, take a look at what it's actually going to look like when it goes out to tape. On the uh, 2000 toasters, uh, you're working in 4096 colors, so this effect is going to be actually much more dramatic. And what you're looking at on your computer screen is going to be less close to an actual representation of what you're seeing. Toaster paint always paints in 16.8 million colors, which is a great advantage, what makes it, you know, look broadcast. And, uh, but the computers are only capable of displaying so many colors at a time. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the grid size. The big grid size is really good for laying down elements like these streaks, but I'm going to get into some little more detailed work at this point. So I'll go back under Options and go to Set Grid again, and I'm going to set it down to kind of a smaller size. That'll probably do me just fine, about half of where it was. I'm going to hit the keyboard equivalent J on the keyboard, which brings me over to my spare screen. There's two screens that you can work with in Toaster Paint. And under the disk menu, I'm going to load a frame store. And I'll click on my frame store directory. And here's basically the set of uh, frame stores that come stock. I'm going to load, uh, I'll load the theater. So it just takes one quick moment to load in. And here we go. Now, what I want to be able to do at this point is I want to incorporate this image into the uh, background that we've already created. It's real easy to do this. And it's real easy to resize and reshape the way this picture looks. I'm going to use a mode that's called texture mapping. In order to do that, I need to pick this picture up as a brush. The keyboard equivalents for picking the entire picture up as a brush are B for brush and W for whole screen. And as soon as you click on it, when you move your mouse around, you'll see the entire picture scrolling around. Now I can hit J on the keyboard to jump back over to the, our background. And I'm just about ready to go. What I need to do at this point is I'm going to go under Tools, and I'm going to select the texture map mode. There's texture map. I'm going to go back over to transparency and warping and I'll turn off the hotspot and set my transparencies for zero. Okay, so I'm ready to go. If I draw a square right now, it'll texture map that image into it. So keyboard equivalent, once again, shift R for a filled rectangle. And if I draw out a rectangle at this point, it will fill it with that image. Okay, that looks pretty good, but I'd like to point out something else to you. When you're drawing uh, on the screen using different brush tips, the size of the brush tip actually has a big effect on what the image looks like. For instance here, under Tools, I'm currently drawing with a brush size, it's about halfway, and it has this little circle for a tip. Using that little circle for a tip has actually caused this rectangle to be rounded on the corners. Sometimes this is very desirable, but I'll tell you what, what we're going to create, I want to have nice square corners. What I need to do is go down to the single pixel brush, which is this button here, or I use period on the keyboard, which brings you down to a single pixel. Your pointer then turns into this little set of crosshairs. That's because just trying to locate a single pixel on the screen might be difficult. Now if I redraw this, since I've worked on the grid, I can hit U to get rid of it, 
and I can redraw right over the top of it. And you notice this time it comes out with nice square corners. Using texture mapping will allow me to do lots of strange things to the image. Sometimes they're useful, sometimes they aren't. For instance, I can take the image and squash it down, or I can take the image U on the keyboard to undo that. I can stretch it up tall. And sometimes this is what you, the look you're trying to achieve. But in this case, I want it to look pretty much the way it did. I want to make sure that I draw the rectangle out in about the same aspect as I, the original image so that it doesn't look stretched or squashed. And there we go. I'll hit F10 on the keyboard to bring that up to the program out so I can see how that looks. And I think I like that. I like where that's placed. Now it's important that we lay the texture mapped image down with the grid turned on because we're going to be creating elements that need to actually hook onto the image. We'll be creating a bevel which makes the image look as if it's set into the background. Now once again, we need to take into account for where the sun is shining from in our image, which is the upper left hand corner. Now if this were to be set in, the sun would be shining in such a way that the lower portion and the right portion would have light shining on them and the upper portion and the left portion would be in shadow or darkened. So I'm going to use lighten and darken to create an interesting beveled look. I'm going to use the vector tool and I'll come over here and go into lighten mode. And what this is going to allow me to do is draw a little picture frame around the edge. This will create the bevel for the image. Now because this is all drawn on the grid, it's very easy for me to click these points down exactly around the edge of the picture. So I started in the lower left, worked across, now I'm up in the upper right hand corner. Now, this is interesting, and you can see how by working on the grid, I can only draw a little bit further than I really want to go, or straight out, which is not what I want. I want to make a little 45 degree angle, and working on the grid, it's very simple to find that point. So I click up there, I'll continue the little picture frame, and I think you'll see the shape I'm going for here. It's basically a little 45 degree angle, lightened picture frame. Okay, and I'm going to do the exact opposite of what I just did in the darken mode. And I'll start up here and click around the edges. I know it's kind of hard to see the pointer over the dark image. And simply create the other half of the picture frame in the darken mode. Now if I take this up to the program out, I think you can see very quickly we've created an interesting 3D look as if the image is embossed into the backdrop. Okay, I mentioned before about having a contiguous graphic look for your entire show. And it should be pointed out that since I created this on the grid, I could save this image out, simply jump back over to the spare screen, let's do that, load a different image in, I'll load Amsterdam. I can easily take this image and drop it in right on top of where the other one was. So I'll hit B on the keyboard. W on the keyboard to pick that up as a full screen brush, J to get back over onto our backdrop, and under tools, go into texture map mode, and once again, instantly recreatable. So I can just draw this down and recreate exactly the same size. So that's one way of being able to create a, just a contiguous look. So now I want to add some text into our image. Real easily, what I'll do is jump over to the spare screen. I'm going to get rid of this image. Shift K on the keyboard is the keyboard equivalent for kill or make it go black. And uh, that'll be a good place to start with some text. There's a whole bunch of new features in 4.0 Toaster that allow you to use all the PostScript fonts that come stock with your toaster. So we can do some pretty interesting things with text. So I'll just load up a font at random here. And the way this requester works is you click here and you type in the words that you want and that's about it. So let's just type in, I'll type in uh, test text. Just so you get an idea what it looks like. And it creates a brush. Now I've automatically created a brush at 40 points. That's not exactly the size I want. Real easily come back in, go back in the text requester. And I have sliders here that allow me to make it any size I want. I'd say I want this to be maybe, say, 120-ish, so 126 will be good. I can also alter the width, shearing, and rotation of the text, but for this case, I want this to be about square. I'll hit Create Brush, and it will make me a 126-point tall bit of text. Now, I can take this and place this anywhere on the screen. Looking at my graphic, I probably want it to be down near the bottom like this. Okay. I'm going to hit the period key to go back into a single pixel brush, mostly because I don't like looking at that weird flashing thing. 
So now I'll jump back over to this screen and I'll show you some interesting techniques we can do with text. What I'm going to do is under tools, I'm going to select the airbrush. The airbrush tool is part of the 4.0 operating system. You don't have that if you're running on 2.0 or 3.0 toaster paint. You can create similar looks using rub through and using uh, transparencies. But I'm going to use the airbrush. The airbrush is pretty cool. It allows me to pick a color and I can simply spray paint with it. You can get the idea what this looks like. Okay, I'm going to undo that. There's also stencils that work with airbrushing. They're particularly useful for text. What I'm going to do is turn on a stencil that's only going to allow me to airbrush either within the text or outside the text. So I'll set this to start with in negative mode. And what negative mode is going to allow me to do, I'll hit escape to get rid of the panel and I'll start spray painting. It only allows me to paint within the text. So I'm just spray painting on the text and the, one of the techniques that you want to use when you're using the airbrush is don't ever just paint in solid. If you're going to do that, you might as well just stamp the text down. You want to leave it kind of brushy looking so that it gives the appearance of being airbrushed. The escape key to bring the menu back up and I'll switch uh, my stencil mode to positive and I'll pick a blue. Actually what I'll do here under color, I'll go to pick color which allows me to pick a color out of the palette and I'll just pick one of these blues that we used in the backdrop. That'll look pretty nice. Escape. And now with the stencil in this mode when I spray paint, it only allows me to spray paint outside the text, which down in this dark corner, I think you'll see is going to be useful for sort of accentuating the look of the text. So now I'm not spray painting on the part that I just spray painted purple, but you can see that it creates an interesting airbrushy kind of painted on effect. That's one of the looks that we can achieve. I'll show you a different kind of look. What I'm going to do is load this backdrop. I've saved this previously. I'll hit the escape key to bring my menu back up under disk, frame store, and I'll reload this backdrop. Some of the new interesting things about the new version of toaster paint, it really handles palettes in a way that's very different than the way that they used to be handled. You can do a lot of things uh, in toaster paint now that you could never think of doing in the last version. Uh, some of those include doing things like uh, using the flood fill a little bit more accurately than you could in the past. What I'm going to do is jump over to the page with our text on it. There it is. And I'm going to pick a color like maybe a medium blue color. And I'm going to go through and just simply add that as my new background color. So I'll go to flood fill and just click up here and what it's going to do is fill the entire backdrop with that color leaving the text down at the bottom. Missed a couple little spots, no problem. I can just click in there and it will fill those as well. Okay. Now what this technique involves is using the airbrush, but I'm going to use it in a different mode. I'll hit jump to come back over to our foreground screen. Let's call up our tools panel. And I'm going to go to rub through mode. Using the rub through and airbrush is going to allow us to create a real interesting airbrushy effect. So I'll go to a continuous draw. And let's take a quick look at the transparency and warping menu. Now in here, you actually can adjust how the airbrush works. It's set for 0% transparent in the center and 100% on the edge. And let's make it just a little bit uh, more transparent in the center. So I'll go to maybe 50%. And we're set to do our rub through. Let me get rid of the menu. And now I just start spray painting. You can see how by using textures or text or anything in the background layer, it's real easy to create some interesting sort of washy looks. Once again, in order to make it look like it's done with an airbrush, you don't want to really paint in too solid a uh, type of stripe. You want to just allow it to be airy and brushy looking. So there's another technique you can use to create interesting looking graphics. Here are some backdrops that I've created that allow you to plug in different sorts of images. This is really useful for creating a contiguous look for your show. So I'll just load one up here. And you'll notice what we have is almost the entire element with just the image missing. Now what I can do is jump over to my spare screen and I'm going to load up a different frame store. I'll just pick one at random here. Now I can pick this whole screen up as a brush once again using the keyboard equivalent. I use this again and again. B for brush, W for whole screen. And now I can hit jump screen, 
go into Flood Fill and Texture Map and simply plug in the image. Okay, so let me, I'll jump back over to the spare screen again and let me load a different background and you can see how this works. Uh, let me load this background. And once again, I'm still in texture map mode and I'm still in flood fill. So all I have to do is click on the area and it will fill that area with the new image. And I'll take this and render it out on the program monitor so we can see what it looks like. Now working this way with sort of the modularity in your graphics, it's a good idea. It allows you to sort of plug in new images here and there as you go along. It's also a good idea as you're working to be able to, uh, to, if you save your work in different steps as you go, you can later on go in and pick up different elements and add it in later. For instance, the marble, I might want to take that and use it as a brush in CG or as a texture on something in Lightwave. So if you save your steps along the way, it makes it very easy to be able to just plug new things in. But typically, when I'm working on a show like this, I'll create basically blanks with white placeholders for the images and then plug the images in later. I'd like to show you a really cool new powerful feature of Toaster Paint 4.0 and for this example I'm going to load up a frame store. Uh, the one I want is called Amsterdam. Now when you're working in a 16.8 million color image there's no way you can go in and pick one individual color and tweak it out like you can in say a 256 color image. In those lower resolutions, you can pick one color, tweak a knob, and just say that one color needs to be a different color. Now, what we can do in Toaster Paint is there's a new function under Options, and it's called Global Fill. What Global Fill does is instead of looking for uh, areas of contiguous pixels, as with the Flood Fill, Global Fill looks for every single instance of that color on your picture. So in this case, I've got this red match pack. I can just drive over it, and it will change all those reds to a different color. So this is very similar to what you'd be doing with messing with the palette, and it's a real high-end feature. So now let's see how we can build some different graphic elements that you can use in toaster paint or in the CG, and they'll help with the flow of your show. What I'm going to do right now, I'll uh, load in an RGB image. This is one that you've got in your system, and it's called Verde Pompeii. It's a marble. There we go. Now this look isn't exactly what I want for my show. I want to make it look a little bit different. And one little trick you can use is in the modes, if we go to XOR mode and choose white as our color, I'll use W on the keyboard, the keyboard equivalent. It makes a photographic negative of that color. And in this case, it turns the green into a real interesting purple and black kind of marble. Now using this as a textural element, we can really build some interesting graphics. For this example, what I need to do is turn off the flood fill, and we're going to go into rub through mode. And under options, I'm going to turn off global fill, and I'll turn on set grid, and draw out my little dots to figure out how big my grid is going to be. That's probably pretty good. And I'm going to jump over to the spare screen. Now what this is going to allow me to do in rub through mode, let me get rid of the menu here, is if I go to a filled rectangle, let's say, Shift R on the keyboard, that will allow me to draw out a rectangle and it will rub through that piece of marble. Okay. Now this picture that I've just created, I can very easily just go and pick it up as a brush with no background, with black chosen as the color, and it will go right into CG and be perfect. Okay. It's kind of small and kind of weird and we can do a lot of things to jazz this up, but you get the basic concept. So let's make this a little bit more complex. I can use the keyboard equivalent, uh, Shift V, to go into the vector tool, and that'll allow me to create more complex shapes. So I'm just going to make a little triangle here, and when I get it about the size I want, right mouse button, and it'll draw me in a shape like that. We're not limited to shapes like this. I can go in and make them as complex as I want. And we can also do things to make this look more like 3D. Now we're going to use the same technique that we used for doing the beveling, except we're sort of going to do the reverse here. I'm going to bring the menu up, and we'll go into lighten mode. And once again, because we've started this on the grid, I can very simply click around the outside of the object and create that little picture frame look. Okay, the grid will allow you to only draw on the places where it's the appropriate place to draw. There's the lighten mode, and we'll go to darken mode. The keyboard equivalent for darken mode, by the way, is the three on the keyboard. And we'll darken. 
and go around. There it is. Let's do these more complex shapes. You can see how easily these will add a really interesting look, a 3D kind of look to your project. You can see how easy it is to create a 3D look, even though we've never entered into the 3D program. These kind of elements will work perfectly in toaster paint and in the CG. We'll be bringing these into CG in just one moment. Now because these were created over just a regular flat background, they'll pick up as a brush with no background perfectly. Let me show you how to do that. I'm going to go under Options and choose No Background. Now I'm ready to go. Get rid of the menu. I'll hit Shift R on the keyboard for a rectangle and B on the keyboard to pick up a brush. And even though I'm not actually picking up a rectangle, as I drive around here, you'll see that it really easily picks up and that there's no background with it. So all you have to do is go down to the disk menu and choose Save Brush. This will bring you into your brushes directory and be real easy to access this through the character generator. Okay, well why don't we take some of these elements that we've just created and bring them into Lightwave and we'll really do some interesting things with them. In order to bring these into Lightwave, what I actually want to do is instead of saving these as brushes or bringing them in as brushes, I want to save the entire picture as an RGB image. So once again, let's bring up our menu under Disk. We'll go to Save RGB Image. And we just need to give it a name. And I'll call it Elements. And save it out. Now let's pop over to Switcher and we'll get into Lightwave. Okay, I'm just going to use the pull down, hit the Lightwave button. Now, a lot of people have a lot of sort of fear of going into Lightwave and going into Modeler. There's a lot of buttons in there, but you'll see that using these simple techniques, it's going to be very easy for you to create some very dramatic text elements. So I'll click on Modeler. There's actually a button down here marked Text, and all I have to do is click on that, load in a font, and any of the fonts that come with your uh, toaster are going to be perfect for this, and simply type in our text. So I'll type in graphic elements. Hit the return key and it will create that text for us. Now, I don't want to get too in-depth and make this a real tutorial about exactly how Lightwave and Modeler works. Uh, I'll concentrate mostly on just some quick keyboard equivalents that are going to allow you to get in and out of here as fast as possible. The A key on the keyboard will center your view so we can see what the text is going to look like. I can click anywhere in this window and pull it open in order to see a better view of exactly what the front of this text looks like. I'll hit the A again and it will resize the element so that it fits right in the center of the screen. We can position our text very simply. I'm going to go down and click on Polygon down here and I'll draw a lasso around the word Elements. I'm using the right mouse button to use the lasso. When I let go, you'll notice that all the text is highlighted. The T key on the keyboard is the keyboard equivalent for move. And that allows me to reposition where the text is. So I'll move it down underneath the first word. We've got something like that. You can see how quickly Lightwave and Modeler are going to become a very high-end character generator. In fact, we can do some interesting things in here that we can't do in the character generator. For instance, just like I picked all the letters of the word elements and moved them down, I'll click down here on Polygon click in the blank space here to drop everything. And then with Polygon still highlighted down here, I'm just going to click on the E. Only the E highlights. At this point, I can go in and resize, move, do anything I want to to these objects. So I'll click on Size and click right in the middle of the E, and I can make the E bigger. Okay? I might have to move it around, once again, T for just this one letter. And I can move it over like this. Let's do the same thing with the G. I click in the blank space to drop the E. Now click on the G, the size button, make the G larger. With it still highlighted, the T on the keyboard for move. And I'll move this over. Now I've got something that looks a lot more interesting than just straight text. Now once again, the polygon on the bottom, the blank space to drop that. Now 
As a general rule in Lightwave and in Modeler, if nothing is selected, it's the equivalent of everything being selected. So the functions I'm going to do now are going to affect the entire word. I want nothing highlighted. I'm going to use the taper function, taper1 right here. What that's going to allow me to do is to taper one end or the other so it gets larger or smaller. And the look I want to create is maybe something like this. Now there's no way we can do this in the character generator, but you can see it really wasn't that many steps to get this kind of a look in Modeler. I've got the words looking the way I like them, and now I'm going to save this out and bring it out into Lightwave. Under Objects, I'm going to hit Save As. That'll allow me to save it and give it a name. And I'll just type in uh, Graphic Text. Hit OK. Now we're ready to go. I'll click on the Layout button, and we're ready to create our element. An important thing to know when you first get into Lightwave is that the view that you see when you're first looking in Lightwave is not the view through the camera, and therefore is not the view that you're going to see when you render. In fact, looking at the screen, we can see the camera sitting right here. What we want to do is click on View Camera. This is the view through the camera. This is the only way that you're going to be able to get an accurate representation of what your objects are going to look like when you render them. So let's load up our object. Okay, we've got that in. And there it is. Now, I saved that background out through Toaster Paint as an RGB image. Why don't we load that in as a backdrop? I need to go to Images, Load Image. There's our image. I'll double click it and that will load it in. It takes a couple seconds to load and then you'll get that thumbnail that you can see on the screen. Now what I need to do here is position my text element on top of those elements. And to do that, I'm going to go under Effects. I'm going to go to Background Image and load the elements as a backdrop image. And hit Continue. And now I'm going to go under Options and under Layout Background, I'll put background image. This allows any backdrop image to be shown. When I hit continue, it'll take a quick moment to calculate this. But as you can see, what this is going to allow us to do is easily position our graphic element right on top of the background. So now at this point, what I want to do is position the text over one of our elements. And I think the element I want to use is this one right here. So what I want to do is choose under Edit Objects. And I want to size and move this object so that it's positioned correctly over this element. So I can use the size function to bring it down a little smaller and the move function to position it on top of this element. I think just a little bit smaller and we'll be just about ready to go. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now, Quick word about uh, surfacing here. Uh, we don't have to, once again, get really deep into how to surface objects, but I'll show you a couple of tricks that are going to make this real easy for you. Under Surfaces, I'll go to Surface Color, and it's currently set for just a plain white. And, you know, for this graphic, that'll probably be just fine. But if you wanted to use a different color, you just slide these sliders to calculate whatever color you want. The only other trick here is I'm going to turn my luminosity up to 100%, and my diffuse down to 0%. What this does is it makes the object create its own light, and it doesn't react with any light in the rest of the scene. In this particular case, we're not setting up any dramatic lighting or anything. All we want is this nice looking text over the background, and this is what we're going to get by setting the things this way. So I think I'm pretty much ready to go. I'm going to use one other little trick thing here. The keyboard equivalent L is the uh, equivalent for limited region. What limited region does is, as you, if you look at the output here, we've got this little square box. Lightwave is only going to render what's in this little square box. And in this particular case, all we really want to see is this one area. Okay, so now that's what we're going to render. And I think we're almost ready to go here. I'm going to go under the camera menu. And we'll look at the resolutions. I'm set for medium resolution, which is video resolution. And I have my anti-aliasing set to off. You want to have anti-aliasing turned off if you want to be able to pick up these images cleanly in toaster paint. When you have anti-aliasing turned on, what it actually does is it creates color spreads from the background color, in this case black, 
to the color of whatever the element is. In this case, it'll be white. And what you wind up with is several layers of grayscale in there. Now, when you pick black as your no background color in toaster paint and you go to pick it up, it doesn't pick up the black, but it leaves a, a dark border all the way around where we've created this color ramp during anti-aliasing. So when you create these elements, you want to make sure that you have anti-aliasing turned off. Okay, I think we're ready to go. And uh, one last thing under record, I'm going to save this as an RGB image. Okay, so I'm set for my RGB images directory and I'll just call this uh, text element. And I think we're pretty much ready to go. Another quick point, the reason I want to save this as an RGB image and not a frame store is that toaster frame stores are actually a compressed format. And in that compression, it actually does a little bit of anti-aliasing. It softens the image just a little bit. RGB images are going to give you the cleanest, clearest image and will pick up the best in toaster paint. So I think we're ready to go. For rendering, I'm just going to hit the F10 key on the keyboard. And here it comes. You can see that it comes extremely fast. And at this point is writing. And we're done. There's our element. So as I said, looking at the modeler and looking at Lightwave as a real high-end character generator sort of shed some new light on it. And as long as you remember, there's not a whole lot that you need to do in order to get good use out of this. You know, you shouldn't be that afraid of it. So I just have to hit the escape key to return back to the layout screen and we're done. So let's pop back out to switcher and back into toaster paint. And we'll go in under the RGB menu. So disk, load RGB image, and there's our image. Double click it and it'll load in. So there it is. Now, once again, because this was rendered over black with no anti-aliasing, it'll be real easy for us to just pick that up as a brush and it'll load right into CG. What I need to do to do that is bring our menu back up. Uh, we need to make sure our color is selected for black. Under Options, I'm going to go to No Background. On the keyboard, Shift R for a filled rectangle and B for a brush. Now, when I draw this out, it doesn't matter how big a square I make as long as it covers the entire object. So now we have our brush picked up and as you can see there's no background. Okay. If I go into the disk menu and under save I click brush this will allow me to save this out as a brush that I can load into the character generator. Now you shouldn't feel limited to objects that you've created in toaster paint for this technique. Uh, if you know how to use Modeler, of course, this works just as well if you're creating everything in Lightwave. You can also use scans of images, uh, logos, business cards, that sort of thing. Works just fine in here. Okay, let's take these elements now and we'll actually load them into the character generator and you can see how that works. Let's call up our menu. And I'm just going to exit out to the switcher. And let's load up the character generator. Okay, in order to load your uh, graphic elements, what you want to do is go into the controls menu and then the plus brush. We've created these as brushes. When I click on that, it'll open up the brushes directory and lo and behold, here they are. So let's load in the uh, triangular brush we created before. And if I click on the screen and then go to that, you can see what it looks like, okay? So you get an idea of what the shape is going to be like. And I could real easily load in some text and put text over the top of it in here. But you don't get that flexibility like you do in Lightwave. So let's load up another brush. We'll load the one with the text. That was called Graphic Text. Once again, click and go to Graphic Text. And there it is with the text. Now you only see the outline, but you get a good idea of how that's going to be positioned on the screen once it's ready to go. So I'm actually going to throw this one out. And let's grab this element and position it. I think down lower left hand corner probably be good for this. And continue. It's set to be a key page. Now the only thing we need to do in order to make this work correctly is we need to set our shadow attributes and our outline attributes correctly. 
Now, if you picture the way the CG creates text, you have the color of the letter, and then behind it is the color of the outline, and then behind that is the color of the shadow. So you need to be real careful about how you set up your transparency attributes. These brushes can be transparent to live video behind them, and it's a real neat effect. But you need to be careful about how you use the outline layer. If the outline is set to be not transparent, obviously what's in front of it is not going to be able to be transparent to the live video. So you need to be real careful of this and really watch it. Now typically on elements like this that we import from the paint program, you don't want to use an outline at all. So I'll click that off. There we go. The drop shadow looks good. Let's go under colors and we'll take a look at our drop shadow. And let's set the shadow to be transparent, which it is. And I think we should be pretty much ready to go. It's a key with, trans with a transparent drop shadow. And I don't have any transparency on the letter. We'll hit F9 to pre-render it into our preview bus and F10 to bring it out onto the program bus. And let's take a look at what this looks like over live video. Well, so far we've seen how we can create elements in Toaster Paint, bring them in through Modeler, the Layout, the Character Generator, and create some interesting effects. But what I'm going to show you now is something that's even more exciting, and that's animation. Now, don't let the term animation frighten you. You know, to a lot of people that means you have to buy expensive decks, single frame controllers. I'm going to show you techniques where you don't even have to render anything, where you can create some real interesting effects using your switcher. These effects include rotoscoping and uh, interesting textural elements that will move on the screen. Why don't we take a look? Okay, so I'm going to pop out of the CG program and we'll pop back into Toaster Paint. I'd like to take a moment right now and talk about rotoscoping. It's one of my favorite techniques. And before I show you the technique, let's talk a little bit about what it's all about. A rotoscope is actually a device. It was originally a film projector that was used to shoot film up on the back of an animation disc. Artists then would take their uh, cells uh, over the top of it and trace out the motions. What you wound up with was a very realistic motion path. Now that technique has evolved over the ages from being very photorealistic in drawing up to more hip, modern kind of looks. And uh, I'm going to show you one of those techniques right now. I'm going to start by loading in a couple of RGB images. These could be frame stores just as well. And uh, the key here is that you want to load in two images which are similar but not identical to one another. And I have a whole series of images of this guy playing guitar. Now. The technique I'm going to do here is going to be sort of, you know, a real outstanding visual effect. So what I'm going to do is paint this up like it's made of neon. It'll be a real interesting effect when it's animated. The basic techniques here are that you don't want to be too perfect with what you're drawing. And I'm just going to use a draw tool, not filled. And I'm just going to very loosely outline the shapes here. That's about what I want there. After I get the first shape drawn, U on the keyboard to undo it, J on the keyboard to jump over to the spare screen, and then A, which is going to leave just that line over black. J, once again. Draw in the next element. That's probably pretty good. U, J, A, J. And the next, U, J, A, J. And I think you get the idea. So now we've got basically the entire hand done. And we'll continue using this technique. And now we'll do the guitar strings. In this case I'm going to choose a different color. I'll take purple now. And once again, I'm going to use the vector tool here because it allows me to draw a nice straight line. I pick a point at the beginning and a point at the end, hit the right mouse button and it's done. I'm going to hit jump and I'll hit the A key to redraw that. Now when I get back here you'll notice I left that on. That's an option that you may choose to use. Some people like to actually leave the drawn on part on the original image so that you can know what you've done already. So I'll just continue here along the same tact with the vector tool, bottom of the string, top of the string, right mouse button, then J, A. Jump back, here, and here, J, A. 
The only tricky part I think we're going to run into in this particular image is where the fingers are. So if I pick one here, and I'll just run the vector up to about where his other hand is. J, A. And then starting off again, we'll go up here. I think you get the basic technique here, and really it's important to note that you don't have to be a real artist in order to be able to do this. You just want to follow along the outsides, uh, and also the looser you do it, sometimes the hipper the look is going to be. The only trick sometimes is that you have to pick whether the colors that you're painting on represents the light parts or the dark parts. So if you're doing like someone's face, it can be kind of difficult if their skin tone is one color and their hair is another. Sometimes you have to experiment before you get a look that's right. So let's take a look at what this finished effect is going to look like. I've got uh, one frame finished over here, and I'll jump over here and I'll load in the other one. I can preview this effect from right within Toaster Paint. If I hit F8 on the keyboard, that assigns Toaster Paint's main out to DV1. If I hit F10, it will render the current image into DV1. Now I'll hit J on the keyboard, which puts me over to the other image. F9 on the keyboard, which tells Toaster Paint to output to DV2, and hit F10 again. Now once both of the images are loaded, I can hit F8 and F9 and it'll switch between the two buses. And on the program out, you'll actually see the effect taking place. As you can see, this effect is very easy to do. It doesn't require a whole lot of artistic ability. All you're really doing is going around the outline. It takes a couple minutes to create, and it yields a stunning result. I'd like to show you an example now that I did for a music video by Bela Fleck and the Flecktones. Now I'd like to show you another example of two-frame animation. Come back over here, and I'm just going to kill everything out of here. Shift K on the keyboard is the keyboard equivalent for kill. Jump over to the other screen, and I'll kill this one as well. And for this example, we're going to use some text. I'll click on the text button, load up a font here. I'll pick one at random. I think, uh, let's see. This one looks good. I'll give it a size, somewhere around maybe 150-ish. And I'm just going to type in the word sale. It will create that as a brush. And I'll stamp it down right in the center of the screen. I'm going to hit J on the keyboard to jump over to the spare screen, and A on the keyboard to place that brush down in exactly the same spot on both screens. I'll hit period on the keyboard to get rid of that big brush. And here's where the fun starts. What I'm going to do is just pick some colors. And I'll want something fairly bright. And something in a nice reddish color would be good. And under Tools, I'm going to choose a draw with a fairly large brush tip. Something like this will be just great. And then simply, I'm just going to paint little squiggles around the word sail. And I'll do this all the way around and kind of coming out of the word. Get rid of that menu by hitting Escape. And when this is done, I'll hit F10 so I can look at it up on the big screen. Looks just about the way I want it. So now I'll hit J on the keyboard, go over to the other side, and I'm going to paint new squiggles. I'm not even look, thinking about the old squiggles. Once again, sort of the more random feel you can get to this, the better it looks. Sometimes those little dots work well. That'll probably do pretty good. I'll switch over to the other bus by hitting F9 and F10. So now I have two almost identical images, one in buffer 1 and one in buffer 2. And hitting, once again, F8 and F9 allow me to jump between the two. Now I purposefully created this over black so it could be keyed over live video. Let's take a look at what that looks like now.
And here's an example of a vignette using the same technique. Okay, we've talked about designing a graphic look and how to get good, outstanding graphics. But right now I'd like to talk about how to use the switcher effects to your best advantage. We can actually use the switcher to create animations. So let's load up some effects. We find our effects if we go to the Projects Files directory and click on Effects. Now right off the top, something like this, like an arrow pulling an image across the screen, is probably going to work pretty good. Let's take a look at what that looks like on video. So I'm going to go back into Project Switcher and pop up a couple of frame stores and I'll do the effect. So what that does is it pulls the new source on. Okay. Let's load in some other effects. Projects Files, back into our effects directory. I know there's some good ones in here as well. So I'll just pop a couple of these up and we'll take a look at these. These flip your image around. Now each of these effects can be used with keyed graphics or just by doing builds, one frame store on top of another. By using a border type effect such as the arrow, we can actually bring a new element on with what appears to be an effect or it creates an animated look. Let's pop into Toaster Paint and create something that'll work with that. I've loaded in an image that I created earlier, and I'm going to do some work on it to make it work as an animated effect. What I want to do is add, let's say, a rectangle. So I'm going to go to Shift-R on the keyboard for a filled rectangle. Let's get rid of the menu by hitting the Escape key, and I'm just going to paint a dark green rectangle across the screen. What this is going to do is give me an area that I can write text in. So that looks pretty good. Let's hit F10 and look it on the program out. And it looks just about the way I want it to. So now let's go under our text button and load up a font and we'll write some text on here. So I'll just pick one here. I used uh, this font earlier. And I'll create my text. I'll type in lawnmower sale. and create brush will create the text. And there we have it. Now I can simply stamp this down on my image. Okay, we'll use that little trick we used earlier. I'm going to hit F8 to render out to DV1 and F10 to render it out to our program out. Now I still have the original image on our swap screen and now I'll hit F9 to render to DV2 and pull that one out. So now just like in our rotoscoping example, F8, F9 shows our different images. Now let's pop out to the switcher and see how that's going to work. And now let's see how this will look with effects. So I've got this image in DV1. If I hit return or take, I can do a take between the two. But now let's see how it's going to work with our effect. Load the effect. And there we go. Okay, so you get the effect of the arrow flying across and it's bringing on the next elemental graphic. This is called a graphic build. So you can see how I specifically designed this bar to fit right on the end of the arrow. So when the arrow flies on, it looks convincing like the arrow is actually drawing on the next element. This is very important in doing this in a convincing way. Let me show you another example using the same technique. Let me show you another example using keying.
Now what I'm going to show you is an example of two frame animation. We're going to create two images right on top of one another and then use the switcher effect to switch between the two and it will give the effect of one flipping over to reveal the other. I've got some templates already made. Let's load some images in and let's see how this works. I'm going to start off by loading one of the images. So I go to load frame store. And here's our image. Now I'm going to jump over to the spare screen and I'm going to load up my template. I've created this template specifically to work with the switcher effect that flips over. Well, now when you first see this, it may appear as if it's kind of too far off to the left, but I think when you see the final effect, you'll see how it works. So now I've got my template, I've got my image. Let me jump back over to the image. We'll use those keyboard shortcuts once again. B for brush, W for whole screen, and go into texture map mode. Now I've got this brush picked up. I'll jump back over to the template. I've got a number of options here. One thing I could do is simply go to the rectangle, solid, and draw a rectangle right over the top of this. It's not vitally important that you exactly match what you've already got. So now I think we're just about ready to go. Well, I'm going to render this up out to the switcher. And I've got another image that looks just like it. Let's go out to the switcher and we'll get it loaded. Okay, in DV1 I have this picture of the Porsche, and in DV2 I have this picture that comes with the toaster of Kiki Farm. Now I'm going to set it up to key. I've got a camera input into input number two, and I'll set DV1 into my overlay bus, key out black, and then adjust my clip level until it looks good. I think that's probably pretty, pretty right. On my preview bus, I'll select DV2. Now if I do this effect, what you're going to see is the effect of one image flipping over to reveal the other. Now this can be used really effectively for a lot of things. You've probably seen the example of the sports score in the Revolution videotape. And there's a lot of other things you can do with this. And why don't we take a look at some examples of that right now. So as you can see, there's a world of possibilities available to you in the toaster. From creating graphic elements in toaster paint, to using Lightwave and Modeler as a high-end CG, using the CG itself, and creating two-frame animations using switcher effects. You have a lot of possibilities. Now keep in mind when you watch television that you should always keep an eye out for interesting graphic looks. I like to look at the news networks and sports shows. They tend to have a lot of real good high-end graphics, and I like to emulate those looks. Experimenting is really the way that you're going to get ahead. Also, don't forget, you have the whole world available to you as textures using the toaster as a frame grabber. You can grab things like crumpled paper, or if you're doing a news program, just shoot some newspapers and then do a color spread over the top. Basically, anything that you can look at can be brought into toaster and used as a graphic element. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this tape. I hope you got a lot out of it. And until next time, I'm Bob Anderson. Thanks a lot.